the Internet of Things. Uh, and of course, the Internet of Things is a very wide-ranging term, generally describing computing devices in everyday or industrial products or machines that are connected to the Internet and possibly to each other. Some of them are household products. I'm slowly connecting to, uh, to Alexa. And um, you, know, you have to do, do new things like worry about your uh, light bulbs updating their firmware, which you've never had to do before. Um, my wife is not very uh, happy with this, but I keep telling her, Jen, you know, it's getting better and better. Soon, before you know it, turning on the lights will be as easy as flipping a switch. <laughs> uh, but household, household items are probably the least important part of the IoT. Um, enterprise and industrial uses have the potential to radically help us allocate resources, uh, uh, help us allocate resources radically more efficiently. Um, and there are you know, two principal challenges, which, which is what we're going to talk about. First is the network, which is what kind of infrastructure do we need to facilitate a robust IoT. They may need complete uh, ubiquitous coverage, but they don't need to send videos to each other. Or maybe they do. Um, and then second, how do we secure that network? Um, it's one thing for the terrorists to know that I need more ice cream, um, but it's another uh, when you're talking about your self-driving car um, or the electrical grid. So we have a great panel today to discuss these issues. I'll, again, uh, introduce them uh, quickly, and, uh, and then we'll go to, uh, we'll go to discussion. So um, Rob Alderfer is uh, Vice President of Technology Policy at Cable Labs, uh, the global innovation and R&D consortium of the cable industry. He joined Cable Labs from the FCC, where he guided uh, US wireless broadband policy as chief data officer of the Wireless Bureau. And before that, he shaped communications policy at the uh, White House Office of Management and Budget. Ashley Dermer is Senior Vice President of Government Relations and Public Affairs for Legato Networks, and she's responsible for promoting the company's vision to provide next generation connectivity uh, using its mid-band spectrum. Uh, and I think read next generation connectivity is IoT. Uh, and she's a former Capitol Hill staffer who worked with um, Senator Chris Dodd and in the 2008 election of President Barack Obama and the 2004 re-election of Senator Tom Daschle. Jerry Fallhaber is Professor Emeritus of Business Economics and Public Policy and Management at the Wharton School. He previously served as Chief Economist of the FCC. Uh, his current research includes wireless market, public broadband, uh, broadband public policy and markets, spectrum policy, public safety radio, uh, file sharing, music copyright, net neutrality, and IoT security. Uh, the Honorable Daryl Issa represents the people of California's 49th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives, a seat he's held since 2001. His committee memberships include the House Judiciary Committee, where he serves as chairman of the Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet, uh, along with Democratic Congresswoman Susan Del Bene, created the Congressional Internet of Things Caucus. And he speaks to these issues not just as a representative of his district, but also as a practitioner. Um, he holds 37 patents, uh, founded an electronics company, and during that time also served as chairman of the Consumer Electronics Association. Uh, David Young is vice president for public policy at Verizon, where he's responsible for identifying and assessing emerging issues, developing corporate positions on internet and technology industrial policy matters, and assessing key technology and communication industry trends. He also has practical experience in today's topic. He worked in Verizon's R&D uh, group on advanced technologies, technologies including VOIP, data architecture, and audio, video, and image compression, and he has 10 patents. Um, and he's also a member of the IEEE and IEEE Communication Society. So 27 more to go, David. Um, and uh, yes, I did do debate in high school. I can talk a lot faster than that if you want me to. Um, so let's get started. So the first thing, I gave a very brief, quick definition of IoT, but Rob, maybe you can expand on that a little bit. What, what do we mean when, we're, when we talk about the Internet of Things? Uh, sure. Thanks, Scott, and uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with the congressman and uh, my esteemed colleagues. I also do want to thank you for scheduling this panel before the unique alignment of space and time <laughs> makes IoT seem like a petty minutia in the broader cosmological order. Um, but, um, you know, I do have a quibble with the agenda a little bit. You've put IoT after AI, and I would have done it the other way around, in part because I think the sensors and all the connected devices that are part of what we call IoT are actually an input to the applications that uh, we think about when we think about AI. Um, and I, in that term, I mean sort of in the narrow definition, not the generalized super intelligence that will one day rule us all, but in the more sort of narrow verticals of applications in uh, the transportation sector and uh, healthcare and uh, a number of other um, uh, sectors of the economy. And so uh, the easy answer to your question, I think, is IoT is everything that's connected, and we can break that down into 
uh, smaller and smaller categories, um, things like enterprise versus consumer. Um, but maybe just to set the stage a little bit, it's useful to talk about uh, some aspects of why it's interesting, right? So it's growing a lot. That's a big reason why we're talking about it. If you look at the analyst forecasts that are out there, and we all know analysts are never wrong, but uh, the forecast is at least two times growth over the next five years or so, and it's probably likely to be more than that. Of course, um, that growth is, uh, um, estimates differ on where we're starting from, by some counts, we're at several billion already. Others have us at you know, 15, 10 billion. So there's a lot, and it's uh, poised to, to grow more. And you know, there's some skepticism around that. Is this all just hype? Uh, but I think there is some organic trends that are sort of driving things in the direction of everything that could be connected eventually becoming connected. Right? You have Moore's Law driving down the cost and up the capability of devices. That's generating a lot more things that um, produce data. We have advances in data analytics to make use of that data. Um, on the network, we have IPv6 and network bandwidth that are making more room for uh, connected devices. And so, um, I, you know, I think there are some uh, certainly uh, signs pointing in the direction of growth. Uh, on the benefit side, we just heard a lot about that in the prior panel um, in terms of the applications that can make use of all this data. Um, you know, saving lives, increasing productivity. Um, but, you know, I, I think when you start to get into is this all hype or what, you know, what is the next layer below all of these high level trends, uh, there are some challenges. And, um, and it's not to say they're insurmountable, but things are a little more complicated than they might appear at first blush, right? Some of the challenges are uh, technology based, right? A big one is power, power consumption. So as we think about these billions of devices out there, um, a good number of them are not going to be plugged into the grid all the time. They're going to need uh, battery power of some sort um, or an ability to generate their own power. And so there's some trade-off with uh, their ability to communicate and their energy consumption. That will drive certain considerations in terms of the architecture of IoT going forward. Um, there's potential trade-offs with how you program these devices. If they're going to be out in the wild for five, ten years, how do you keep them updated? Um, there are some challenges in the market, right? Um, interoperability um, is, is one of them we see right now. Not all devices can talk to each other. You have some proprietary ecosystems that you need to pick as a consumer before you really um, can take advantage of, uh, of some of these technological advances. There's issues of trust, consumer trust in devices. Um, and, you know, there are other challenges out there. Perhaps, I, you know, I, I put two out that are perhaps most relevant for this room because they're think of them as horizontal challenges that are really enablers or not of IoT, and those are spectrum and security. So as you have these billions more devices come online, we need wireless resources to make sure that uh, they can perform their function, and we need to make sure that uh, as the number of devices grow, we don't see the number of attacks grow linearly. Right. So actually, Jerry, um, I, I had a plan for how I was going to ask you questions, but you've already got something to say, so go ahead. I'm done. Go oh, for it. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, good. I, I just thought I'd maybe jump in here. I mean, uh, Rob knows this stuff much better than I do. In fact, I'm kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum. Some months ago, he called me up and said, how would you like to give a paper on cybersecurity and the Internet of Things? And I thought, I don't know a damn thing about that. Uh, I said, I don't even have an Internet of Things, you know, in my house, right? I don't have a smart refrigerator and stuff. And I thought, well, wait a minute. I have a smart TV. Right? Most of us have smart TVs. Right? And I thought, yeah, I had to connect this to my Wi-Fi. So, yeah, it's on the Internet, and it's a thing. Right? So I thought, yeah, but well, okay, I don't have to worry about it too much. So then I was reading something that said, um, it's a Samsung, right? So uh, Samsung's TVs have these things where you can uh, gesture at it. Uh, oh, no, you can speak to it. Yes, you can speak to it, and it will follow your commands. Okay, now, I, I then read that it also sends that to a third party. Anything that it hears, it sends to a third party for analysis. Okay, so now the next step is it also has a camera so that you can gesture to it. So again, you don't have to use your remote. You can, you know, make signs and stuff. Uh, and it also sends that to a third party. Okay, now here's the kicker. The TV's in our bedroom. Okay. <laughs> So all of a sudden, the Internet of no Things, gestures, yeah, no, gestures, right? okay. <laughs> the Internet of Things be 
began to kind of hit home, as you might suspect. And of course, what happens is occasionally my wife and I have to move the TV out of the bedroom. But uh, so that's what the Internet of Things is, okay? And uh, that's kind of the other side of what Rob was discussing, okay? I don't know if we let Jerry uh, But that's talk what again. it means in, in practice and reality. So we already knew this from YouTube, Jerry. Right? <laughs> That's on YouTube, right? <laughs> okay. It's all I wanted to say. Right, yeah. So, I mean, pri okay. uh, privacy and security related privacy, obviously a big deal. Um, but that also raises questions of, uh, you know, that's part of what, we, what, what this infrastructure is all about. In this case, apparently, we need lots of uh, a bandwidth for video streaming. Um, from Jerry's house, but uh, to, um, to to David um, and and Ashley, uh, you know, how do you all, how do your companies think about what the demand for this will be in the future, and how to target investment? What like, we, you know, how do you target? How, what is investment for an Internet of Things? Sure. So um, again, uh, thank thank you for the opportunity to join this panel. When uh, you think about the Internet of Things, you, you usually think about the thing, the device itself. But it's really a, a system that's made up of, of different parts. The, the device is an important part. Uh, another important part is the network that connects that device to uh, the internet or the backend systems. And then uh, the third part that's important are those backend systems uh, where the data is collected, where the analytics take place, where the control um, uh, of the system occurs. So uh, those three pieces are, are all very important. And so on the network side, um, there, there is no one size fits all. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned video streaming and 5G and, and yes, gigabit wireless connections are gonna be incredibly powerful for Internet of Things and, and the very low latency of 5G uh, connections are, are gonna be extremely enabling. Um, but that's not the only uh, uh, option, and it's not the only requirement, because not all Internet of Things applications require very high bandwidth, uh, upstream or downstream, or very low latency. And so you'll see a diversity of networks and solutions uh, for connecting these devices. For some, your home broadband connection with Wi-Fi is going to be perfectly adequate. Uh, for others, you're going to want it to work anywhere you go, and so you're going to want a very widely deployed uh, technology um, like uh, CAT uh, M1 LTE that's specifically designed for Internet of Things. And, and one of the things that makes it well suited for uh, connecting devices is that it allows for very low power operation, uh, and, and Rob mentioned the importance of that. Um, it also uh, doesn't uh, deliver the very high bandwidths, but again, for, for some applications, that's not the most important thing. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, for uh, ultra ubiquitous uh, connectivity, you, you may look to satellite. I agree with everything David just said. And so, you know, when we, just to bring it up even a, to a higher level, when Legato and we think about can, what do you need from... Was um, that a pun? What? Was, was that a pun? Satellites, high level? <laughs> um, you, you, you know, the key is spectrum. Um, and as David just articulated, it's, it's a really a mix of low and mid and high band spectrum. They all have different propagation characteristics. Um, but really, the networks of the future are going to require each of those and a mix of those um, in order to provide and serve the diversity of applications that the IoT will, will result in. Um, you know, we are focused on the enterprise um, side of the equation, um, which will require um, ultra reliability, high security, um, and ubiquitous coverage, which satellite, which satellite does, does provide. We also are strong believers, again, as, as David mentioned, in just being tech neutral. Um, you know, you could either, historically, you're a satellite company, you're a cellular company, you're Wi-Fi, you're fiber. Um, um, all the different applications actually could benefit um, from a mix of all of those technologies. Again, um, in some of the mission critical I, industrial internet of things, they will require um, the satellite for coverage for pervasive connectivity, um, and then for the, um, the, the ground systems come in um, for the lower uh, bandwidth type applications. Um, so uh, let's talk about the policy aspects of it. And so, Congressman, um, this is probably a good place for, for you to weigh in. I mean, what, what do you see as the, um, as the biggest policy uh, impediments to developing an Internet of Things 
and what is Congress's role, and how does your caucus work, and, and so on? Well, the, uh, uh, the interesting thing for, for policy individuals is we have to unwind the bad decisions of past policy decisions. And, uh, and that's not a small, that's not intended to be a joke line, but it's very, very sincere. When you look at how we've allocated spectrum, how we've sold it, how we've made decisions, uh, I won't name names, but in the earlier conversations, there was a discussion about, well, how did we come up with uh, the Wi-Fi, which today is the clear backbone of so many Internet of Things, including the switches that your wife continues to be uh, confronted with. <laughs> now, it was basically junk spectrum nobody wanted that they could throw for useless things. So I shouldn't say useless because baby monitors were considered, you know, yes, the baby's going to cry and you're going to hear it in the next room on this low powered device. Uh, and, and it was sort of the replacement for the other junk stuff because, you know, we'd had CB and we'd had all this, these others, uh, although 32 megahertz is suddenly in again. But you look at, at this history and you say, okay, if you were going to start again, and if I could put everyone in this room uh, with their not so hidden agendas in a room and said, okay, what works for the people who aren't in the room, which is your wife, the consumer, and you say, okay, what do we need to do? Well, the first thing we need to do is recognize that the technology of today is no longer bandwidth confined, meaning the idea of I make a product and it, and it can do X amount of bandwidth with an antenna, that's pretty much passe very broadband products that can sense, that can listen before talking, that can uh, operate in very diverse ways with very d different power consumptions, uh, mean that you can have devices that are much better than they once were, except of course, as we look at it, you know, where do you see it? Well, you see a Wi-Fi that, you know, the newest, the, the newest Wi-Fi finally is a mesh network that is somewhat intelligent, that does cover all the available bands uh, and uses a third band so it's not trying to actually uh, make the decision about what, how, what you're doing on a band that was in fact junk band but rather went to one that travels further than the cells. So when the cells can't talk to each other, the devices in the mesh network can. Well, those devices are succeeding in spite of, if you will, history. So let me just quickly go through two things. I promised everybody that I talked to beforehand that I was going to comment on the shovel being an artificial intelligence device <laughs> along with the horse. Well, the switch that you were talking about that you're putting in for your, your, your lighting system is in fact in many ways a shovel because you can push on the button and it turns on and off. It is the horse because it's a little smarter when you hook it to your iPhone and it's even a little smarter, well-trained, maybe, a, maybe a, a, a well-trained dog, when you tell Alexa that you want to turn the lights on at 50% on red, uh, if you have that feature. It's not yet, we're not yet talking about artificial intelligence. Where artificial intelligence is clearly that next step where it continues to think and learn and get smarter than any one director of it. And so all of that is going to be necessary, and none of it particularly needs government involvement, which is the good thing. You will innovate that without us. But let me just bring you back to two closing items. When I was a young, 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 young lad, there were three things that came to my house. Uh, and I'm one of six children, so we always debated which one I was related to. There was a, there was a postman, there was a milkman, and there was actually a bread man. And they each delivered to the house. And you know, the, the milkman and the, and the, post, and the uh, bread man are gone today. That doesn't exist, although Amazon has sort of replaced it for both. The fact is that at one time, the government made a decision that, that there was a universal delivery obligation. In other words, that there was a service that was there. Essentially, the service was free, even if you paid for uh, usage, and that we'd make sure it hit every point on the planet. So when the government is trying to decide about this essential new service, have we fallen short in three areas? One, 100% coverage of our entire country, even when it's inconvenient, which the post office does. Two, real standard setting, whether set by government or set by private enterprise in cooperation with government, 
for true universal low power, true universal mid power, and then obviously the question of proprietary high power, the, the classic license space. And that's where you see the question of, are we there? Have we really done that? I'm going to close, even though I said it already closed with, then we get into cyber and all the questions of security, and that's bigger than the discussion for today. Obviously, we're all going to have to work on it, and government doesn't have answers, and the private sector does not yet have uh, a perfect answer. But my view is that if you go back, not to the shovel, but you go back to the milkman, the mailman, uh, and, and the bread guy, and ask the question of, wait a second, is, is there one universal guarantee to every point on, in America? And if not, is that the government's primary role, is sort of ensuring universal access, which is not done just by licensing space. It's got to be done by initiatives beyond that. Um, Jerry, you've been thinking about the institutions that do and don't exist uh, for IoT and IoT security. So how does how does what you just heard play into that? We talked, uh, Congressman Issa talked about unwinding bad policy decisions. I mean, that relates to institutions. Um, Is this me? Or, it's you. Yeah. Oh, it's me, okay. <laughs> I yeah, can talk right. about unwinding bad policy, but no one's going to count on a congressman to do it. <laughs> right, so, Jerry, it's up to you. <laughs> let, me, let me discuss the institutions issue in, yeah. in, in uh, the concept of cybersecurity. And let me mention, first of all, the cybersecurity issue associated with the Internet of Things. It's generally been perceived that the Internet of Things is a whole lot easier for hackers to put viruses on. They tend to be unprotected. Nobody who has them, like me, is paying any attention to them. Uh, and in fact, we have had at least two very serious uh, DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service, uh, one of which was um, last uh, October, a company called Dyne, which is a, 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 runs DNS servers, and therefore uh, it took down a whole lot of people who use that DNS server. And another one um, at a company uh, uh, called um, Imperva in December. Uh, these are new viruses, and the protection against them is very little. Now, when Rob asked me to do this, I sort of said, well, I need to kind of read about this. So I read up a um, report by BTAG. I read a uh, broadband internet te technical. Uh, also, Department of Homeland Security saying, what are the problems and how do we fix them? Okay, and it was basically the technical aspects of how to protect against the Internet of Things cybersecurity. Okay? The most recent thing I've seen actually came from Cable Labs, which is, goes a step beyond that and is actually quite good. I advise you to take a look at it. It was published this summer. Um, but they're simple stuff, okay? um, hard to do. Uh, oh, it's also focused on consumer goods, too. There's lots of other Internet of Things that has to do with this stuff. Use the best current software, put the security in at the design phase. Simple, right? If we designed the internet like that, we'd have a lot different story today. Um, automated secure updates uh, and um, vulnerability management, you know, strong authentication, you know, configuration tested and hardened, all this kind of stuff. Technical stuff. And I thought, thank God somebody else did it. I don't know anything about this. Okay? But I did know that the big problem was, how do we actually get this stuff in place? And there is the insti institutional issue. Okay? Um, the industry we have here that makes this stuff, you have to think about what this industry looks like, because those are the people that are going to be doing the security. Right? Um, first of all, we got hundreds of manufacturers making little computers that go in refrigerators. Hundreds of them. Okay? Most of them aren't in the United States. So they've got to be part of this story. Dozens of sellers who are selling refrigerators, home alarm systems, televisions, and what have you. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of different industries, so they're not even in the same industry. Um, millions of consumers, most of whom don't even know they have a computer in these things. So at least with people that have PCs, you know you should probably download an antivirus thing, right? But with a smart refrigerator, you don't know that and you don't care. Okay? And the last thing that makes this even worse is that the real danger is not that you're going to load something into your refrigerator 
and somebody's going to figure out how often you open the refrigerator door and therefore whether you're home or not. The real problem is launching DDoS attacks on other people. That's an externality. And if you have, you, you were one of the people that launched it, you don't even know it. And the damage is not through you. So how do you fix that? This is a kind of an industry where, you know, you need to establish standards um, throughout the vertical chain. Uh, you, you need customers to be involved. That's what you need, okay? Um, now, there's a couple of conclusions about this. Have I talked enough on this, or should we do a little? Okay, um, a little well, actually, let's, let me, yeah, let yeah, me yeah, ask a couple ahead, and then you continue about that. So, um, to, uh, to, take, to add another question to that, um, well, first, say, you know, several, many years ago, I was on a, a National Academies panel that were on uh, looking at software reliability. And it always kept coming back to the question of um, connectivity um, versus reliability. Uh, and is there a similar trade-off here that, you know, the device can be, the more connected the device is to the rest of the world, the less secure it is, or is that a false trade-off? And Rob, um, because Jerry mentioned the report that just came out of Cable Labs uh, that included these uh, cybersecurity issues, maybe you can start off by answering that. And then I'd like to hear from the, um, uh, the network people if, yeah, how they view that. Sure, and uh, you can go to Cable Labs Informed Insights to check out some of our recommendations on this. Um, in terms of your question, Scott, um, you know, if you think about IoT narrowly, perhaps the answer is yes. A more open IoT at the device level could lead to uh, uh, reductions in security. But to David's point, that IoT is much broader than devices, right? It's systems, it's, uh, it's applications. Uh, I don't really think at, at the level that's important to consumers, there is that trade-off, right? Because just to, to provide an example, your light bulb in your house doesn't need to be talking to the entire internet. Right. If, it, if it's open to the entire internet, it might be compromised in the way that Jerry just outlined and start sending spam or send, uh, being part of a larger denial of service attack. Uh, but it can talk to your home hub, a gateway in your house that uh, has an appropriate firewall and is, entails no reduction in utility for that light bulb to you, the consumer. And um, when we think about IoT as devices, not just devices, but systems and applications and connectivity, well, how has connectivity grown uh, in recent history and probably much further back than that? It's through network effects. And so, um, you know, to the extent IoT is going to be growing, it's going to be because there is value in devices and systems being connected in a smart way. At the very, very highest level, I'm not sure this question makes sense. Um, when you, does it make sense um, in an industry in this industry to, um, to desi design the devices to be able to go through a hub or something that sort of has more controls, or is it cheaper just to build something that can connect to anything? Uh, well, cheaper is, is, can be um, you know, a problem in the IoT space. There are different architectures, right? You can have device-to-device -device communications, device-to-hub, uh, device-to-cloud, cloud-to-cloud. Um, but you know, in terms of the, you know, sort of the, the trade-off between security and um, you know, cheapness, as, as you put it. Um, you know, I think there is a way to bridge that gap, right? And it gets a little bit to the institution's question that uh, Jerry was outlining, and uh, as was the Cong congressman, in terms of developing standards and making it easy for um, new suppliers of IoT devices to build to those standards and allowing consumers the ease of connectivity that comes from a common platform. So. If you have industry coming together, writing a spec, a standard, making that available broadly, um, then it, you sort of get past the, the problem of the small IoT manufacturer with five people in their company just trying to stand up a product, not thinking about security. They can easily adopt the industry standard uh, as their base code for th their device, get it out quickly, and it's secure. So uh, from the network yeah. perspective, how do you? I, I mean, uh, we don't. Just to say it another way, we, we actually don't think connectivity and security is, are mutually exclusive in any way. I think, you know, this, there's such a diverse range of applications and products, and then in the IoT system itself, you have devices, you have the architecture, you have the applications on the other end. And so, you know, the way we like to think about it is each layer of the, of the stack, essentially, um, will require a different kind of... Um, uh, look at what security requirements are necessary. You can, you know, we don't think there, 
all systems are created equal, all applications are created equal, you know, should the electric grid, as an example, have the same type of security requirements as, um, you know, as my young daughter's, like, uh, electric toothbrush that connects to my, my phone? Probably not. And so I think as an industry, what we're looking at is what type of security requirements and best practices, almost, do we need to implement at the, either at the device level or the network architecture design level to make sure that each application has the security requirements that it needs to uh, meet a consumer's expectations. We also are, you know, absolutely believe in consumer education. You know, data is really what's becoming extremely important here in terms of um, uh, enterprise and industrial um, entities taking um, the connectivity to the next level and what can we do with that data in improving our operations and maintenance. And so, you know, making sure that consumers understand what type of data is being collected and how it's being used is extremely important as well. Yeah, so you asked about um, the, uh, the hub versus the directly connected devices. And uh, having a hub is certainly can be advantageous, uh, as particularly for low-cost consumer-oriented devices that are, are designed for operating in the home, let's say. Um, but, uh, you know, the, that just moves the security point to the hub which is connected to the internet. So you still have the, the same security issues, um, but now it's, it's hopefully being taken care of by a vendor that understands that space, that has the uh, resources to make sure that it's done properly. Um, the good news is I think that most of the tools are already available to produce the secure internet of things. Uh, whether you're talking about digital certificates that will authenticate devices and allow them to be managed uh, securely, updated securely, uh, encryption over the network that will ensure the integrity of the data flows. Um, you know, all of these tools are available. Uh, the problem is that not everybody either knows that they're available or uses, chooses to use them. And even worse, there are some really basic practices that are, are often ignored, like creating a, a, an Internet of Things device that has a default password that's published. And so, you know, it's, it's easily um, accessed by anybody who wants to go in there and, and change the settings. So um, the, the tools are available. It's really just a matter of, of producing the education, uh, both at the consumer level and across the ecosystem. See, but I, I, um, I mean, just because the tools are available doesn't mean that they'll be used. And so far, I haven't heard um, anything about incentives. Well, to, Let's, let's look at the incentive as it's never going to be good enough. The education's never going to be good enough. So uh, uh, decades ago, I was a young armor officer training for how we were going to beat the Russians in the next war, the then Soviets. And there was an interesting difference between how the US went to war and how the Soviets went to war. We went to war with every single tank. I happen to be an armor officer. Tank had a radio and full training of how to command. Mm -hmm. Every private had the same level of training of what would happen if you went to war. The Soviet Union had command and control that used hand signals for the most part and literally did not put radios in anything except the command vehicle. They put fake antennas on the rest. The part of the concept was that they didn't trust mm -hmm. their soldiers. So now let's skip forward. You're in a battle, and you're going to have losses. In the case of the Soviets, our goal was to knock out their command and control, and then the rest of the guys didn't know what the hell to do. Surrender was, was hopefully the choice. When we're looking at these trillions of devices, and we know there will be failures, the first question is, how do we ensure that failure of one, a hundred, a thousand, a million, is not failure of the system? And so rather than say, well, we're going to have better education, we're going to change the passwords, we're going to make you use a complex password, we're going, to, we're going to put a hub in, the first thing is the system has to be built with an assumption that there will be failure. Mm -hmm. And the assumption that the, the systems, whether it's the electric grid, the, the internet uh, itself through denial of service protection, has the ability to protect itself and to deal with inevitable losses. And by the way, some of those losses are an electronic device that simply goes haywire. Yeah. You know, there is, the, there is the device that creates its own noise, like this one they had to substitute just a moment ago. And so I think you start with that. The second part, which has a bigger public interest, is a debate that is not settled. Uh, and, and I'm very personally uh, in, involved in it, if you will. The former FBI director, Comey, came before Congress 
and swore under oath that he had no ability to get the information he needed from the San Bernardino bomber except by forcing Apple to create an active remote backdoor into the product. And that's what the magistrate had ordered, uh, feeling that there were sufficient constitutional protections in this order. Now, a matter of weeks later, an Israeli company for a million dollars gave him the data he wanted. And a few weeks after that, a Cambridge professor for $187 showed how he could do exactly what a Rube Goldberg guy like me had said in this argument with the uh, then FBI director. We have to have a real debate about whether encryptions and protections are real and unbreakable. Because if they're not real and unbreakable, then they will be exploited. And if they are real and unbreakable, then organizations like the FBI, the CIA, and others will be constantly disappointed that they can't get what they desperately want. And this is not a new argument. Back in the 90s, uh, quite frankly, we had 128-bit encryption as a cap. And the only way we got past that was that Microsoft and others began having their software hacked and given away for free um, all over the world. And it created a pressure because of its failure. So we're repeating that right now, just as we did with just encrypting software so it couldn't be easily copied. We're repeating the question of, do you have an absolute right and do we have an obligation to make their, these things secure? And if so, that inevitably will empower those who will use it for nefarious purposes to be protected. And that, that goes all the way to the highest levels of governments around the world. Jerry, how does that fit into the sort of your institutional Yeah, um, let me uh, finish up here. I certainly don't want to get in the way of the eclipse. <laughs> Um, let me talk about uh, some of the incentive issues and some of the institutions we could set up. One of the problems is with, with such a very wide vari a variety of players in this game, how are we going to get everybody on board? Okay. Well, there's sort of two extremes here. Uh, one I know that Rob prefers, which is to say, let's set up voluntary organizations. We'll adopt standards, and you know, we'll sell that. Okay. All the way to the FTC or somebody saying, we're going to have regulation. Now, I think there's, I identified a number of one. One is, which is a voluntary approach. The problem is this works well when you have a small number of firms, all of whom can internalize the externality. But when you have hundreds or thousands of firms, it becomes very difficult to actually police this. Okay. Um, this would work, for example, if you could say, let's do the equivalent of a good housekeeping seal of approval. That would be a totally voluntary thing. And if everybody signed up for that and consumers actually gave a damn, this would be a good solution. I'm not too sure this is the best solution for IoT. Um, second one would be voluntary standards, but with legal enforcement. And lawyers would love this because, in fact, uh, product liability then becomes the way to enforce it. Okay, That works. Uh, it, it, well, the problem with this, of course, is that enforcement is costly. Um, and it may, it may completely miss the externality, which is to say, I have this on my refrigerator, it creates all this damage to somebody else. I'm not, I don't care about suing the guy for this, you know. So this is perhaps not a good way to do this. Um, regulatory, this is the third, regulatory uh, and um, uh, joint efforts with regulatory commissions and with the, with the, uh, um, I'm sorry, with the, with the industry. Um, joint effort. Uh, an example to this might be EPA and Energy Star, okay, where you know the appliance people get to put on the Energy Star thing. But that is done jointly with the EPA. Uh, SEC, uh, for all the problems of that's regulation, that's a form of joint regulation and, and industry. Uh, works well when you have a lot of firms. Uh, customers are not involved in the problem and there's some externalities. There's a potential <coughs> there's a potential for <coughs> a regulatory capture <coughs> which we have to be concerned about. Excuse me. This could work well for IoT, I think. Um, you have to have if you do full regulation that's going to not respond to technical change very well. This would be, 
EPA fuel efficiency. Okay, uh, it can be enforced, but it's slow to change. In a technical field, that's not a good solution. I would tend to go, <coughs> excuse me, with the joint regulatory voluntary operation. I think that would be a good solution to come up with. It's enforceable, it can change the technology, um, and it's something I think that'll work well with IoT. It will not be perfect. You know, we've had a lot about what happens to the tail of things. We've had a lot of that discussion, and, and everything you said I think was excellent. But you do need to have some institutional structure around which laws and standards can be built. And it's important to think that through of totally private versus totally public. And I think some mix of the two is probably the way to go. David, yeah. So, so you, you said, asked about incentives and, and suggested that there is a lack of incentives. And, and I would push back on that. I think that there is no one Internet of Things, right? We're talking about a, a broad spectrum of, of applications and solutions. And so if you're a business uh, and you are uh, uh, connecting your fleet of trucks, you have a strong incentive to make sure that those uh, systems are secure and you're going to require that uh, the supplier that you're working with will, will ensure that security and, and you will take all the steps that you need because uh, a failure will cost your business either, you know, in terms of, of uh, uh, reputation or you know actual actual loss or damages uh, if you're a city and you're deploying a, uh, a smart traffic management solution you have a very strong incentive to make sure that that is not hackable that somebody can't get in there and so I think there are incentives for those sorts of things it's when you start getting down to the uh, you know the the security camera for your home uh, that uh, that you know that you're buying from a, a small company that Right, and so you, as the consumer, might not care if it gets hacked and is used in a denial of service attack, uh, but you know it causes that externality. And so I think segmenting sort of the the use cases and, and the problems and, and identifying where perhaps the the incentives are weaker might be helpful. Um, there, are, but there are also mitigation solutions that that can be put into place. Um, AI, you know, came before this, and and one of the applications of AI could be identifying abnormal communications and, and traffic patterns. So if that video camera, you know, starts engaging in, in abnormal behavior, the AI in your home router or, you know, in your service provider's network could identify that, flag it for you and suggest, hey, maybe you want to unplug that thing and, and uh, you know, check the passwords and, and settings and whatnot. So I do think that there are a lot of uh, incentives already in place. Um, but, you know, that said, uh, and then, of course, you know, the, uh, the FTC as a backstop, if you do fail to properly uh, secure your IoT network and consumers' data is lost, you know, you are uh, liable to be called in front of the FTC and, and you know, uh, forced to enter, a, a, you know, a long consent decree, so. And that's probably the one issue that I think is least resolved right now in cybersecurity. The Federal Trade Commission has decided and has some pretty common cases. The Tiversa one is my favorite, uh, which is the Mike, Michael Doherty case for those who haven't heard it or read the book, where they could not name best practices. They did not have a standard, and yet they wanted to hold somebody accountable for things which they had not published and after the fact went into. Uh, and you look and say, well, there's where the rub is, and I think uh, where Jerry, I think, was very good. Government cannot keep up with best practices. But that means that when government enforces, or even when plaintiff's lawyers enforce, they're, they're alluding to the idea that you should have known. And I think that's where a lot of what the Internet of Things is going to be all about is industries creating best practices, governments quickly making them known that they are, from a regulatory standpoint, a need to know if you're going to manufacture uh, hardware or software for the industry, and then pushing that down. Uh, and of course, the update question comes along. Where this falls apart is where we get back to the consumer. Now, I have a bias because I came out of the consumer electronics industry, where, where our motto is, if they have to read the instructions, you've failed in the product. And uh, I know that's not just for the men in the room. Uh, the, the reality is that if we do our job right, the Internet of Things will be products which may have to be shut down when you do something wrong, but will not require the consumer 
to be trained and educated and updated into best practices. And it will not require that the product on the day it's launched be anything other than best practices with the firmware on that date and updatable as threats change and evolve. And, and by the way, sadly, obsoletable when their processors can no longer meet the demand of a future product. That sequence of events is where, and I think you've done a great job of, of playing it, it's a hybrid of things we've done in the past. So is the Federal Trade Commission liable when somebody knowingly is deceiving the public? Yes. Are they the bastion of, well, after something happens, you must not have lived up to best practices? I think not. And I think that's where we're going to have to change government's view, keep the plaintiff's lawyers out of it whenever possible, particularly when we're talking about a technology that updates hourly. So I'm going to go to questions in a minute, but um, Rob, sort of where you are at Cable Labs, it's sort of an intersection of, 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 of standards and, and companies and, um, and, and regulation, and, uh, and it's sort of a, it could, it's, it's a kind of a place where these sorts of efforts might come together. So without naming names, who exactly um, is sort of not paying attention? Um, not, you know, not willing to sort of go along with what needs to be done. Right, so um, can I name names? No, uh, um, no, um, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> no, no, no. The reality here is, you know, I think as service providers in cable labs, we obviously uh, work for the cable industry um, that provides connectivity. We have an ongoing relationship with the customer and we feel uh, a pretty hefty responsibility to do what we can to protect uh, our customers. Um, you know, that, that uh, sort of relationship isn't uniform across the IoT ecosystem and there is this tension between those that really just want to ship units and those that want to have an ongoing relationship with their customer. Um, so, you know, it, it is a challenge, and I think some of what's been discussed is exactly the, the right type of approach, and I would quibble with uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry's Energy Star analogy. And just to be clear, in that program, EPA and DOE actually write the rules, right? It's a public comment process. It takes a year, two years to, to play that out. So I, I think that moves too slowly for IoT. In addition, it's a much more complex problem that we're dealing with here. So, um, you know, I think it really is up to industry to step up and uh, uh, sort of um, provide the tools that the ecosystem needs to, uh, to address these issues. And just as a, a bit of a plug, um, and as an example for what the industry is doing in this space, Cable Labs and Verizon both uh, are members of the Open Connectivity Foundation. Um, OCF is 350 or so companies actually writing code. This is not just a forum where we talk about best practices, we actually write code to enables interoperability and security for IoT devices and make that code available through open source to get at the, the issue of the small guy just trying to stand up a product. So these solutions are starting to take root. Um, what I would note though is defining success is important to keep in mind, right? It's, it's tricky. If we go back to the, uh, the example that Jerry raised of the, uh, the Dyn uh, DNS provider being attacked by the Mirai botnet, um, just to put the magnitude of that attack in perspective, some researchers, security researchers, uh, have recently concluded that the population of devices that comprise the botnet, the Mirai botnet that led to that attack and took down Twitter and Netflix and other popular services, had a steady state uh, device usage of between 200 and 300,000 IoT devices. Okay, so that sounds like a lot until you think about the billions of devices that are out there. So this is less than 1% of the devices on the market in IoT today uh, were responsible for a major event like that. So we need to be uh, cautious about what success looks like. I don't know that we're ever gonna have perfect security, but um, certainly I think there are some tools in place now um, to make um, incremental, if not more than that, improvements. Um, actually, this is a different kind of question. Um, setting aside the issues you've had with your spectrum, which is What are been, you talking about? Right, yeah, no, it's just smooth, <laughs> smooth sailing. Um, as an entrant into this industry, yeah. do you, is it, um, are certain aspects of setting up a network for this sort of future yeah. internet of things easier? And are there also more difficult things like getting into some of these, um, these groups that uh, are yeah. setting standards? So, um, 
So we actually view it as, a, as an unbelievable opportunity um, in a lot of ways. I mean, I think um, what the congressman was talking about, how do we undo a lot of these things? We are talking about, for Legato, we have a significant amount of spectrum that's largely unencumbered right now. And so that presents an unbelievable opportunity to start t looking and implementing from the start some of the tools like Rob just talked about, some of the, you know, the best practices that are already out there, um, and, and focusing the network on core industrial industry like the utility sector, oil and gas, that are really desperate and looking for um, an advanced level of connectivity that's just um, um, not quite meeting the, the needs that they have right now as they look to um, um, further automating their systems and such. And so, yeah, I mean, the story and our story is not new to anyone in this room, um, but we actually, looking at it the other side, really see a unique opportunity to deploy greenfield spectrum in a way that meets um, and uses the best uh, technology that we have and tools that we currently have today. Um, there's a little time for questions. Uh, Richard. The answer is 11.43. Right. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, yeah, as one of the authors of the BitTag report on IoT security, I was really intrigued by what Rob was saying about it, uh, OCF. Because the thing that, that we identified is basically that IoT, the IoT industry needs something that's the equivalent of the Wi-Fi Alliance that can put pressure on 802 to devise standards and then define test procedures and all that. And providing software, I think, takes it a step further. So. Congratulations, I'm glad you're doing that. Oh, well, th thanks, we're not quite there yet, right? Work is ongoing, it's a new organization. We just stood it up last year. Right. Um, but uh, it is a forum where these sorts of discussions are happening. The intent is to make it a consumer brand that people can recognize, have certification against it. You get at yeah. the transparency issue and make it easy. Yeah. And, and it, we shouldn't forget that it's like, not that IoT has a unique security problem. The internet itself is not very secure. When, when Wi-Fi was, was first developed, it wasn't at all secure. So this is kind of a, there's kind of a process that new technologies go through where, you know, the big challenge is to make it work at all. And then you worry about how to make it secure. But I, I think there's, there's sort of a change in that mindset where we really want to start designing security in at the beginning. So, yeah, yeah and the code's going to help. Questions? Okay. Um, well, that seems like a good place to wrap it up. So, thank you all for the right. Uh, thank the panel uh, for the discussion, and um, so we can all go upstairs and outside and see uh, nothing um, if it all works out. And uh, we'll have uh, glasses, to, uh, viewing glasses for you all.